Hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. It's me, Cindy Howes. Before we get into our conversation with Lily Henley, I want to let you know that there are a couple of different ways you can support Basic Folk and stay in touch with us. Number one, you can join our mailing list. We send out a monthly newsletter and a couple of messages here and there. That is like the best way to stay in touch. You can sign up at basicfolk.com. You can also follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Basic Folk Pod. Uh, You can make a financial contribution to Basic Folk. If you give at least $60 for the year or $5 a month, you get access to our bonus episodes, which is located on our website on what we like to call Backstage. You can make your contribution at basicfolk.com slash donate. You can leave a review and rate us on Apple Podcasts. You can tell a friend. You can tell people that you meet at the 100,000 weddings that you're going to this year, because that's right, friends, wedding season just around the corner. Okay, let's get into Lily Henley today on Basic Folk. Her latest album is a full-on celebration of her Sephardic Jewish heritage. The lineage of Sephardic people can be traced back to the Iberian Jews expelled from Spain and Portugal in 1492. For Jewish people, there are many diasporas and lots of different ethnic heritages and practices that have been adopted and blended from many other groups along the way. Lily's heritage is different from the Ashkenazi Jewish people, which is the most represented Jewish sect in the United States who can be traced back to Eastern Europe. Lily graciously gives a very brief overview of the diaspora, which is pretty intense and amazing to take in, and the geographical and cultural differences. Lily grew up moving around a lot and talks about how that act of moving from place to place impacted her as a young person and how it affects her still. She found a sense of belonging and home at the fiddle camps she attended alongside other musicians her own age. At camp, she learned to play Celtic, Old Time, and Cape Breton-style tunes, while at home, she played traditional Sephardic tunes sung in the Ladino language, also called Judeo-Spanish, a combination of Spanish with Hebrew, Arabic, and Turkish elements, and is spoken by less than 100,000 people. As an adult, she was inspired by living in Tel Aviv for three years and immersed in Sephardic culture. She was awarded a Fulbright Research Grant and is currently an artist-in-residency at an art gallery in Paris. She recorded her album in Paris, France, on a label run by a Sephardic community leader while being embraced by and collaborating with the Sephardic community there. Oh, Lily has another new non-Ladino album on the way, Imperfect by Design, is coming January 2023. It's an indie folk anthology about love, belonging, independence, and change. Look out for that and enjoy this deeply educational conversation. We'll take a listen to a song from her new album, and then we'll get to our conversation with Lily Henley on Basic Folk. Si dice la novia uh, con el chalibi Thank you so much for joining us today on Basic Folk. It's so nice to see you. So nice to meet you. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Okay, I am. I was telling my dad that I was going to interview you, and he's like, "Where does she live?" I was like, "I think Paris, but I think she's in California right now." So 
that sounds right. Yeah, so I'm currently in Paris at least till the fall. Um, but I am sort of like I still am kind of like technically based in Brooklyn. And I am okay. currently in the Bay Area um, doing some press for the album and visiting some family for like a week. Just kind of worked out Sweet. that way. But yeah, you are correct. And you grew up moving around a lot, from what I understand. Can you talk about all that moving? Like, how do you think that act of moving from place to place helped shape your personality as a young person? Hmm, that's a really good question. Uh, it's always a challenging question to answer only because I don't have, like, another... I mean, I suppose everybody... This is true about everybody, but I don't have another... Um, experience to compare like what would I be like if I was um, from from somewhere um, but yeah my dad <laughs> my dad's job combined with my mom's sort of inability to pick a place which I think has been sort of going on since she was a teenager um, just ended up leading to us moving really regularly um, all through my childhood and like until I left for school. And I've sort of done, I've done a little of that. I've been in Brooklyn and it's the longest that I've lived in one place um, in my entire life. And it's How been, long is that? It's been about, you know, like we travel a lot and stuff, but it's been about, um, I think cl like nine years maybe. It, it feels really, I mean, I feel like that's a significant amount of mm. time anyway, but it is, I think the longest I lived in one house for sure and often location as a kid was maybe like a couple years or three years something like that um to be like very honest what what moving around that way really did for me as a kid was kind of like cement this fe identity feeling that I think is just carried all the way through till now which is this feeling that I don't that I'm always kind of an outlier because even you know usually if you move a lot as a kid you're parent is in the military or there's like a diplomatic thing sure. or something there's something that you can label yourself with and that would happen a lot as a kid I I people would say where are you from or you know when I first was in college people would say where are you from and I'd say oh I I moved more than 10 times before I was 10 um <laughs> and they'd say like oh so you were a, you were an army brat or something and I always mm -hmm. felt like this strange thing of being like I I really wasn't so is that even an okay thing? Like I had this feeling of do army brats like to be called army brats? <laughs> like is that, but I also just couldn't, I just didn't have that experience. It was always this, do you want the short story or do you want the long story? And, um, <laughs> and I feel like that is kind of, it's like kind of my state always is just to not mm. be, to not have like the easy identity, like to not have the straightforward identity and it's taken a really long time for me to accept that because it really there's just a such a strong human inclination I feel like to be part of something and to be mm -hmm. inside of you know to be categorized along with other people to feel part of it's a challenge because also you don't want to be taking up too much energy trying to explain yourself and have people just think that you're you know, you're overcomplicating yourself for no reason just because you think you're so special or something. You know? Sure, sure. Well, it's like so interesting. Your uh, Jewish cultural identity kind of like ties in with all of that. But like there's just so much there, Lily, that you brought up that like it's just like I feel like we could end the interview there. We won't. But like it's like <laughs> there's just so much to unpack in that answer. And I, and I know that we're going to come back to some of those themes we were just talking about. But first, I want to talk about summer camp. <laughs> um, you g grew up going to fiddle camps, playing with musicians, like kids your own age. Um, so what did camp and playing music with your peers there mean to you? And how do you think it's impacted the musician you are today? It really is such a formative experience. I mean, partially because I still have really close friends that I met at that time. But I think for me, I mean, I think for all of us, it's a very impacting experience. But for me, I feel like it had an added level because I didn't have a real, you know, I, I didn't have like a community that I'd been a part of like all my childhood that I was part of back quote unquote home. 
so when I went to camp, that was, that felt really strongly like this is the most communal experience. This is the closest that I feel like myself. I'm, you know, meeting other, other kids that really want to do the same things that I want to do. Like at the time, just like this nerdy activity of just being (laughs) obsessed with folk music and, it felt like going to some kind of home. And it. I also had this very strong um, ownership of that experience because I started performing when I was 13 or 14. And, you know, like not, you know, I was still a teenager, you know, doing normal teenager things. But I performed a lot and I made money and the money that I made, I used to send myself to camp. So it was sort of this mm. feeling of this is something that I'm I'm doing for myself. Um, I think it was something that my parents felt like was important for me to feel that kind of ownership and to oh yeah, definitely. feel to kind of feel that good job, parents. Yeah, especially my mom. She really disliked and wasn't big on reminding me to do. You know, she didn't want to be like harassing me to practice or something. You know, mm-hmm. and that was and that wasn't really something that she had to do a lot. Like I started music pretty pretty late, like uh, instrumental music. And I was always very self-motivated about it because I was old enough to sort of understand. How old were you? I started playing violin when I was 11, which um, in the world of violin is actually pretty late. Senior citizen. It's like... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like all my closest friends, it was like they'd been playing since... I I really don't know if you start when you're three or four that you have any real memory of not playing the instrument. Sure. It's like a formative experience. At camp and uh, growing up at home, you played uh, Celtic old time, Cape Breton, and traditional Sephardic tunes at home. I grew up, I mean, I'm trying to decide where to start, but in terms of fiddle, I started with like a really strong love of Celtic music that, you know, my parents were just completely baffled by. When I started playing the violin, we were in a town in Illinois where there were a lot of Celtic musicians that would come through because it was close enough to Chicago and Milwaukee that um, there'd be these big Celtic festivals there every summer and people would come through and they'd come through my town like they'd add. Now now as an adult musician, I understand that they were just like adding a gig to their tour that kind of worked for their tour that probably just added a little income. But for me, it was like, because I had already been really obsessed with Celtic music, I was, I think, five or six when I heard this Kevin Burke record called Open House. And I was just completely obsessed with that album. And I went to... um a concert that they came to where we were living at the time in Albuquerque. And I like cried through the entire concert and like went up to him at the end. And I said something like, this is the greatest night of my life. (laughs) And he, and he looked, he looked completely like, like he didn't know what to say back. I still remember like being that age, like five or six and kind of having an understanding that like I was in the presence of an adult that like didn't really know what to say. (laughs) But I felt really strongly like from that moment on, like I was like, I'm going to play fiddle and it's, I'm going to play this kind of music. Um, And all the while, because my family is Jewish and we have kind of a strong sort of non-assimilated cultural family connection to our cultural background. I was growing up with like a lot of, um, we had some, you know, I had some knowledge of like our Sephardic family and less connectivity. I mean, I also have Ashkenazi family, but I had less connectivity with like Yiddish culture until I was like a later teenager. I didn't experience it the same way. Is Ashkenazi kind of Eastern European? Yeah. Ashkenazi is like what is like Eastern European Jewish culture. Um, Okay. You know, so when, you know, people in the United States are much more familiar with, like, the idea of Yiddish and Eastern European culture, I still think the average person that even, you know, even in an area where they know a lot of, you know, Jewish people still has kind of a minimal understanding of that culture also. But I grew up with some some actual songs in Ladino and a lot of Hebrew songs that had Sephardic melodies. Um, that, But that, to me, felt completely disconnected from... Mm -hmm. being into fiddle music so with fiddle it was celtic music and then when i went to fiddle camp i heard old-time music and bluegrass and old-time music is sort of like the gateway drug to like other american folk styles i feel like because it it's more tune based there's like there's less like actual taking solos or something like that so it's sort of a good branching out way of kind of experiencing new melodic forms or whatever and um so that all got exposed to me when i was a kid You 
you spent some time at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, which sounds like when you went there, correct me if I'm wrong, there was not a folk or roots program, but there is now. Um, And you've talked about how it's like it was kind of traumatic to be around classical musicians who were like super intense and read music. So how did you find the place and what are some takeaways you discovered there? So what was true then that's not true now is that the department that I was in, which is called the Contemporary Improvisation Department, and it used to be called the Third Stream Program, it was just much smaller when I entered. I think I was one of like three or four undergraduate. It was literally a situation where certain classical musicians that I'd meet at the school because New England Conservatory is a really, you know, highly acclaimed, like venerated conservatory institution in the United Mm -hmm. States. You know, they're coming from like Interlock in high school and it's like very serious. And they could be (laughs) in the school and not realize at the time, like the department that I was in existed. Mm. I went literally because I had played a gig at um, the Chicago Celtic Festival. I was like 16. It was a stage where they would feature young performers that were like really up and coming, like the future of the music or whatever, you know, and I had like a half hour set and the person that was supposed to come after me just didn't show up. And the person that was running the stage was like, just play for another 45 minutes, which for like a 16 year old solo performer is like, and I was like, okay, sure. I looked out into the audience and I saw like a number of my friends. Natalie Haas was like in the audience. She was like a friend that I had met at Fiddle Camp. Uh, Both Natalie and Brittany are really old special friends from Fiddle Camp. And I just invited them up on stage and they came up and they jammed with me on stage. And Brian O'Donovan, who's Aoife O'Donovan's dad, who runs a major, um, like a very important Celtic radio station and had been in Boston, was the MC of the main stage and he happened to be backstage. And Aoife was like a part way through my department, you know, CI department at NEC. And he came up to my dad and said, where is she going to go to school? And my dad was like, we don't know. You know? <laughs> and he said, she should, she should apply to NEC. And my dad basically sent in my application. Like I did the audition materials or whatever, but I, my dad was like, you're, I was, I was very, you know, I'll go to Berkeley. Like everyone I know is going to Berkeley. And my dad sent this application in and And I just got in and I really didn't even know if it was like, I didn't understand that it was hard to get into. Like I auditioned and I wasn't nervous because I didn't really understand what it was because I didn't have like a strong belief that I was going to be able to go to music school as like a completely non-classical folk musician. You know, there were things I really got out of it, but it was a really, you know, like I've talked about, it was definitely a challenging experience. I felt like it was one of the many experiences of my life of just somehow ending up in a situation in which my life experience and who I was just didn't meet the con- the standard, like the way that most people were. So trying to explain to classical musicians that I, you know, that I didn't have a classical background or, you know, why is my vibrato so, so not standard? Like, and how are you going to get, I remember somebody asking me like, how are you going to get an orchestra job if you're not going to, if you're not practicing or excerpts or something. <laughs> I was like, I never even dawned on me to get an orchestral job. Yeah, there are like certain regrets about being afraid to say like what you don't know. That's a really common experience. Maybe not even just for like somebody like me that was at the time. I just came right between like Aoife had graduated. I came. But now there's a lot of people coming in right after I graduated, Sarah Jarrow's arrived and I think after she went lots and lots of people have gone somebody on the board recently told me that the CI department has the highest rate of musicians leaving school and still being musicians yeah it was very challenging and for a while I thought it hadn't been a positive side to it like I had kind of post conservatory traumatic stress disorder or whatever you know there were like all these things that I felt bad that oh I'm not good at this or I don't know about this or I was like one of two women instrumentalists in the whole department so there was a lot of that of just you know (laughs) just dealing with really macho like like when you're in it and you're you're also 18 or 19 you don't think like these other people that I'm struggling to connect with or whatever are also kids young guys that are 
trying to figure their situation out and feel really competitive and are trying to figure out how to make it in this scene. And now I feel like a lot more empathy for, you know, even students that were really difficult to be around in class or so I don't know. Yeah. I have questions like very specific questions about being a person of Sephardic Jewish descent and immersing yourself in this culture and then performing this music and then also writing your own music. So I want to actually like try to lay it out for people who don't know about it, but also like kind of do the heavy lifting for you. I don't want to speak for you. So um, let me try this to try to lay it out and then you can correct me when I get it wrong. Here we go. For Jewish people, there are many diasporas and lots of there's not a great word for this, but like lots of sex and different ethnic heritage. So the culture can like vary from group to group. And since there is a diaspora, lots of group have melded cultures and traditions together to make up even more subcultures. We doing okay so far? So far, pretty good. Yeah. (laughs) And Sephardic Jews are descendants from Iberian Jews expelled from Spain and Portugal in the late 15th century. So in 1492, Spain said to its Jewish people that they either need to leave, convert to Catholicism, or be killed, Um, which not not great choices. (laughs) Um, So can you explain to this Gentile the differences between Sephardic Jews who were expelled from Spain And I cannot remember the word that we used earlier, but like the kind of like mainstream Jewish people that we might know from Eastern Europe. Yeah. And there's, I mean, one of the things that I feel like is important to say is there's more categories and there's like a few broad categories that are helpful, but basically Sephardic people are the, exactly like you said, the descendants of Iberian. And I say Iberian because it's also Portuguese and Spanish. The pe- the Jewish people that had come to Spain, I mean, from the Middle East, you know, hundreds of years before. And Spain and Portugal are both so close to North Africa that they're actually, you know, at the time before in 1492, um, there were population of think kind of of North African Muslims that um, were called Moors, uh, which is a tricky term. But um, in 1492, there was an expulsion of both them and Sephardic people. But the term Sephardic really doesn't, you know, before 1492, it was just all these people living in the Iberian Peninsula with different cultural and religious traditions. They're different from each other. Different from each other, but all, you know, but still part of the same, you know, they were all Iberian. They were all Spanish or Portuguese and Mm -hmm. they were all in this multi, multicultural society. And they all spoke a form of Spanish that's real, like this kind of arcane hundreds of years old form of Spanish that had a lot of, it had a lot of Arabic in it and it had a lot of, um, you know, slightly different grammatical and pronunciation and, you know, different things. I was taking Spanish lessons from a really awesome linguist, and she would, instead of calling it Espanol, she would call it um, Castellano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. (laughs) Just to be funny. (laughs) Totally. It's a a linguist joke. Yeah, I like that. Um, But yeah, so it was just, uh, they spoke this kind of arcane form of Spanish. And then 1492 happened. And there was a couple different diasporas of Sephardic people, like over the next maybe 100 years, like there was, there was an expulsion in Spain in 1492. There was an expulsion in Portugal later. Um, uh, So there's a lot of complex history there that's like not necessarily important if you want to understand the overview but basically the term Sephardic or Sephardi really gets applied after the expulsion, after these communities left the Iberian Peninsula and this language, which we call, there's a lot of discussion about what to call it. You know, sometimes it, Ladino is like a more modern term, um, Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-Espanol in Morocco, their their version of it is called Haketia. Um, uh, a lot of Sephardic people that really speak it just call it Judio. Which, is, which just means Jewish, which is really the same thing that Yiddish means. Yiddish just means Jewish in Yiddish. 
right, right. So basically the difference is, is just that. It's like a big cultural difference. The religion is mostly the same, but there are different cultural practices and ways of practicing the religion between Sephardic people and Ashkenazi people who are the um, Jews that ended up in Eastern Europe. And because you're like in one in these places for long periods of time, you know, for hundreds of years, you adapt to that, you know, so the culture of Eastern European Jews is very connected with the culture of Eastern Europeans. So the music has Eastern, Eastern European influences and the accent of the way that they pray in Hebrew has this, this accent, like the minute I hear somebody praying with a with a Ashkenazi accent, it's the Yiddish accent. It's like this different way of pronouncing Hebrew. And in Sephardic mm. communities, the way of pronouncing Hebrew is a different accent and the way of the way that it sounds when you pray or the melodies that you use or the kind of foods that you eat at holidays, all of those things are like connected but separate different cultures. And there's also Jewish people from, you know, con- connected Jewish people that are under this umbrella of Mizrahi, which is like Sef- Jew- Jewish people from really the Middle East that didn't have a diaspora into any part of Europe at all. And that even includes, you know, the Bukharan Jews and the Jews from from um, Central Asia that spoke, that you know, that still, so there's still some people speaking Judeo-Farsi and Bukharan, and there's so many different dialects of these languages and Judeo-Arabic, um, you know, Jews from Yemen have like their own dialect of Judeo-Arabic. And it's... um. I think sometimes the word Sephardi is used as like an umbrella term over all Jews that aren't Ashkenazi because we follow Mm. the same, we follow the same um, or very similar liturgy that's separate from Ashkenazi liturgy. So Jews from Iran or Jews from Uzbekistan or Jews from all over the Middle East, um, including Sephardic Jews who are, I'd say that the main places that the Sephardic diaspora took Jewish people was to the former Ottoman Empire, so like Turkey and I mean, the Ottoman Empire was so large, it covered like a huge portion of the Middle East and the Mediterranean. So it included Greece and Serbia, but also Turkey and a large portion of North Africa, including Morocco, which was never a part of the Ottoman Empire, but it is a place where both Sephardic Jews have cultural history and also Jews that are not Sephardic, meaning that they were Moroccan, but they never had a diaspora to the Iberian Peninsula. So they didn't speak Ladino unless they were in a community where everyone was speaking it and they had to learn it. And that was even true in Bulgaria. There was a a population of Sephardic people that spoke Ladino and there were Ashkenazi people that learned that spoke Ladino because they were surrounded by people speaking Ladino. So then like Ladino was spoken all across the Balkans, all across North Africa and what is now Turkey and in Palestine, you know, for like hundreds of years previous to the modern era, there were Sephardic, you know, Sephardic Jews that spoke Ladino who had made it, they had like a further diaspora there. So that's sort of, It's complicated, but really when you look at culture, just any culture, not just Jewish culture, there's so much micro culture within. There's no, you know, we Mm -hmm. in the United States where things are, these days things are so label specific. There's so much like, can you fit under, okay, you know, black culture, Latino, like Latinx culture. These are really wide categories that encompass such, yeah. so much diversity inside of that. So many racial diversity, cultural diversity. It really, you know, sometimes I get the feeling when I talk about Jewish culture, like I'm just trying to make things more complicated for people and can't you just say bagels and locks and it can just be over. You know? <laughs> it's kind of like um, whenever your physical body will take the path of least resistance and so will like your your mental your mind takes the path of least resistance so like it just tries to like simplify 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 when it's like life is complex people are complicated history is complex and complicated but anyways let me know how much i owe you for that <laughs> history lesson because that was incredible so on a personal level you grew up in this tradition that included the culture of Sephardic Jewish people. So, but like the music on your new album stems from that heritage. But what did you know about your family's background growing up and your connection to this heritage? 
how are you encouraged to learn about and stay connected to it? And how has that like impacted your outlook on life? I've thought about this a lot um, because some Sephardic people, especially like where I'm living in Paris, um, Paris is mostly Sephardic. So as a person with some Sephardic heritage, there are some people you meet where it's very recent, like their grandparents spoke Ladino and they heard it when they were kids, you know, even if they don't speak it anymore. And that was not my experience. Um, I grew up knowing that my my dad's family, that we had a Sephardic heritage, my grandmother um, had learned about it from her aunt who had done like a lot of research. And probably it came from like a certain degree of like snobbery of like feeling like we're not Eastern European and that's cool because back then, you know, when my grandmother was growing up in New York City, assimilation and like, you know, there were so many immigrants from the from Eastern Europe that were trying desperately not to, you know, to just assimilate and be American. And so I think mm. my my great aunt felt like a certain degree of like, well, our family's not even from Eastern Europe. <laughs> but I don't, my grandmother really, she's very, she's in her 90s now. And so it's like later that I, when I came to her, all she could really remember was, okay, our family name was Perez. It's likely that they came through Central Europe to get to the United States. But what really connected me to it was that when I was living in Northern Illinois as a middle and high school age person, we experienced just so much anti-Semitism, just like real anti-Semitism, like really Mm. serious, um, exclusionary, scary anti-Semitism. And we were living in an area where, I mean, there was also a lot of racism. It was really segregated and a lot of strife and stress in the community. And there were a lot of, immig- of like, you know, t- like farm workers from Mexico and central other parts of Central America. And because of how unaccepted our family was by like mainstream Christian white people in this area, I just adopted Spanish as like my new identity for like a couple years. I just learn Spanish from like kids in the area and felt much more accepted by that community. And it was, it was so much so that, you know, certain kids would say at the time, they'd be like, your English is really good. And I'd be like, yeah, cause it's the language, that <laughs> it's my real language. <laughs> but um, that, I, it's a strange way to come to it, but it was like having Sephardic heritage in my family help. It gave me this feeling of, I'm not completely lying about being connected to this mm. like and it and it's like nobody actually you know it, it wasn't it was just in my head that that was important you know like I was making friends and the kids that I was making friends with weren't thinking about our cultural similarities or differences it was just to them it was like okay I can communicate with them and from but for me it was like a desperate desire to feel connected to a community And this Mm -hmm. community being a community that felt more accepting and even the religion, like I'm not from, I'm not Christian, but like I was in like a Spanish language nativity play as an angel, like in the local kind of community nativity play. And it didn't feel the way the other parts of the community of the, that area felt where, you know, if you were in a Christian situation, you were probably about to be converted to Christianity. And it was going to be like a discussion about, are you going to convert? And are you going to be baptized or whatever? And this was just like, it's a communal thing and it's a play and you've been given a role and it has three speaking lines, you know, (laughs) much later when I lived abroad in Tel Aviv, there is a lot more Sephardic culture there also because there was so much immigration Um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s from, like, North Africa and other areas where people have Sephardic heritage. And so people know the song, you know, if you sing, like, a really famous Sephardic song, people will know it. And and I suddenly heard all these songs, and I heard some songs that I had heard as, as a kid, and I heard new songs that I just hadn't heard because I'd been living in these, like, really isolated, um, American areas of the world, um... And I just felt like a really deep affinity with the music. I wanted to maybe take a little bit of a left turn. And you, we can skip this question if you don't want to talk more about it. But you posted this series of photos 
taken by your friend Antonia Esposito in September of 2021. Uh, the 35 millimeter pictures oh, of you. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And the caption is quite long, but it's like, at the start of an adventure, a new thread wading gently into the waters of the unknown. And then you talk about the story that Antonia took these photos of you. I think they were like a few years earlier. And when you say, when I look at my life now, I'm stunned by how much less fear I feel. And I don't want to read the whole quote because it's so long, but very beautiful. Um, There's some beautiful words about like coming into yourself and how at the time the photos were taken, you said, I still saw myself as a quickly deteriorating commodity to be leveraged by the highest bidder, personal ownership over my own body, my own story, and over my own potential seemed elusive. So I am intrigued at how this album and also your decision to pursue the music of your ancestors and of the heritage um, that you came from have been at the forefront of this transition. And could you talk more about it in whatever detail that you're comfortable with? Hmm, wow, what an interesting question, an unexpected question. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, partly it's just like we're all on Instagram and we're trying to figure out like ways of connecting with that platform that don't feel totally fake or, you know, I don't, you know, there's, I mean, you know, also it's like you're trying to post something because you're, you want people to hear your music. And if you don't post a picture of your face, it doesn't show your <laughs> post to anybody. So there's like a lot of, yeah. But also like I've like I- experienced posts recently where I've posted something like longer than, you know, like a sentence or something like that, that something longer that's like not like a promote type of yeah. post. Mm-hmm. And I think people enjoy reading that stuff. And I think it really resonates with people on a deeper level. I mean, there are people who are just like scrolling, 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 but... You know, I think a caption like that can be very elevating for people. So I hear you on the like, the algorithm wants my face type of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true, though. It's like, and I've learned, uh, I have like several like friends that are in really successful bands where, you know, people will say you shouldn't post something so lengthy, but their entire method of dealing with social media platforms is to post like long poems and like, basically essays and their fan base like and I feel it too even knowing them personally I feel like I'm always I want to read through what they yeah what they wanted to talk about and it's very it is it's true it's very so I guess um you know and I, I just feel like every this is a very relatable experience and finding my own experiences to be relatable is kind of a new thing for me because I feel like until a couple years ago, I just had this feeling inside myself from having so many kind of contrary experiences that were like, Mm. there's never any like easy answer. Like, where are you from? Maybe I should just choose a location. So this is easier. Um, Or, you know, where did you grow up? What did, what, what, what school did you go to? Because I was partially homeschooled as like a kid or you know just all this kind of stuff um oh good yeah just throw that in there too <laughs> to get you know, homeschooling into the um, mix yeah homeschooling um and even I, and I think I feel this way strongly about being Jewish that there's kind of a mainstream idea of like what Jewish culture is that just does not feel applicable like I just don't feel personally connected to it um you know that would have been like a relief to be like oh I'm I'm part of this community and I belong to this group of people. And it was like, oh, it's true. Sometimes like I do meet Jewish people where, you know, we had a similar like social justice-y kind of, um, I mean, maybe I don't even mean that, but just like to me being Jewish has to do with being outside, being the other, like being the wandering. Mm. And to me that has, that means you empathize with people that are marginalized and that, um, you're interested in not like in a not interested in the majority culture kind of way, but more in a, this is, these are things that are important too. And you see the cracks and you know, this, that to me, that, that is like my most formative Jewish identity that I don't think is really exemplified by kind of mainstreamized Jewish, Jewish for Jewishness's sake kind of culture that exists. And I think there are lots of people that agree with that, but it's definitely like an isolating experience 
Um, but I guess when I posted that, I was seeing all this connectivity and I feel like where it was really coming from was as a femme presenting person, you know, woman or whatever. Um, and as a person from like a kind of complicated minority background, you know, with a lot, like I have a lot of privilege, but I've also had this really minoritized experience growing up. Mm. Um, I've been very sensitive to feeling that whatever I feel connected to or whatever I want to create, that somebody is there to tell you that um, it's not important or it's not going to work out or it's not like, why would anybody be interested in music that isn't in English? Or, you know, why, why would you, why not do something that, you know, more people are going to identify with or whatever. Um, And I think for me, not kind of taking that step of just being like, I'm going to create lots of different kinds of art and I'm going to, I'm going to create music that some people will say is not applicable to enough people and it's not going to be important or whatever. And, um, and I think that's an experience that musicians have and artists have all the time of people saying, Oh, what you're doing doesn't look like what other people are doing. So what are you doing? And really good, I mean, really good music and really good art doesn't, you don't always have like a blueprint for, you know, what, what it should be. Um, So my posting about that was really just, I was feeling, and I still feel this way a lot, like just, I finally gotten past letting that kind of energy close enough to me that it affects what I feel like I'm allowed to do. You know, am I, am I, and that goes for just across the board, like even on an identity level, like that, you know, back to what we were saying about if you post your face, if you post like a, you know, a pretty photo, that's what people want to see. But then also you'll have people saying, no one's going to take you seriously because you're, you're, you're cute or, you know, you're over sexualizing yourself or, um, and there's just a point where, all you can do is just not let, you know, maybe it affects you, maybe it's painful, but you do, you know, you do what feels, what feels good to you anyway. And you don't, you know, you don't like repeat back to yourself kind of negating things that are going to be said regardless, you know, people are going to say they're going to make assumptions and, and some people aren't, you know, there's going to be, people that are going to understand. And actually when I posted that, it was really wild to me how many people wrote me really con, really interesting messages about their own, how they experienced that post coming from so many different places. So I guess Mm. it like, you know, I don't have like a massive fan base, but it definitely resonated. Like people that I didn't really know reached out to me and said, and also a lot of people said just very encouraging things that made me feel like, not everybody, you know, is, is thinking diminishing thoughts. You know, I really try to foster in myself a strong, non-competitive feeling towards other musicians and other women, especially like, I really don't, I don't, I I don't really want to believe that there's kind of this depression mentality, this sort of, um, there's not enough to go around and we all scarcity. Yeah. The scarcity, the, exactly this feeling that, we're all competing for like, I don't know what, you know, yeah. <laughs> something we're competing with something and we have to win. And yeah, I think I'm a pretty ambitious person, but I'm a really uncompetitive one. I don't want to feel that way when, you know, if I achieve some kind of success, I don't want to feel that other people are not happy for me. And that always is where I try to come from when, when, when somebody else receives mm. success is to just think, just imagine how they must feel like the work that they feel like they've put in the journey that I feel like I've been on to try to discover, you know, who I really am to myself and what kind of music and art and impact I can make. I wonder if that comes from all of the empathy that you've cultivated due to your outsider experience. Well, yeah. And I mean, also like I was born while we were living on um, the Hopi Indian reservation. There are a lot of, and native people talk about this a lot, that there are a lot of non-native people that kind of 
just adopt native culture and kind of they call them pretendians you know they'll they'll be like oh I have like a a single ancestor or something but because I like my family's only been in the United States for like you know maybe maybe a century um I never you know I lived on the reservation and my godparents are um they one of my godfather died but um my godmother is still alive and you know, they are Hopi elders, but there was never a feeling like, oh, I'm Hopi or I have any claim to this culture at all. I was always like absolutely a very, very privileged outsider to be able, mm-hmm. allowed at all, you know, to have, I lived there because my dad was a physician in the Indian health service and we would go back regularly to visit. Oh, that's rad. But I feel like because it is rad, I do think the IHS has had some. I'm just going to give a disclaimer for friends that are Native. Like, it hasn't always been positive for Native people. But um, but it is important um, health care. But basically, that experience gave me this formative, really formative identity of being being an outsider and my own experiences of being an outside of being a minority around people that were actually um, oppressive later on in life gave me certain kind of empathy, but there's also a certain empathy that you get from experiencing another culture that's really threatened. And that has, you know, I, I really, as a really young child, I knew my godparents' stories of being taken to residential schools, you know, and, having the wrong birth year on their identity cards, you know, like, because they didn't, you know, they were just basically named and aged, like, without being asked. That experience, like, is another, it's a really deep, complex part of how I see the world. Because it's, like, something deep that I experienced that I, like, don't have any personal um, ownership of at all. The way that that relates to my music, like, it has a lot to do with okay, what, what words can I, can I try to connect with and express myself yeah. through? I wanted to talk about the traditional songs on the album, Horas Desoradas. You say these old ballads, some dating back to the expulsion, carry the hopes and dreams, the daily worries and existential thoughts of the Sephardic people. And mainly... It was women who would write and sing these songs about daily life, transience, heartbreak, independence, and change. So historically, women were not allowed to participate in Sephardic liturgy. Liturgy, yeah, yeah. This is true. Liturgy. Yeah, that's true. That's true across, like, most, you know, patriarchal religious societies Mm. that, like, women are not often traditionally included in, like, the singing of the prayers or, like, the... There's some. My mom and I have arguments about this a lot where she's like, oh. <laughs> she's like, there is, like, there are prayers that women wrote, you know, and I'm like, that's true, but in general. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's interesting to think about, too, but how do you think the fact that these songs were written by women have made them maybe different from traditional folk songs that were most likely written by men in other cultures? Well, I think that, and I think this is also true, and it's where I see the connection between my, like, love of, um, you know, American music traditions that come from different places and my connection with Sephardic music, is that, like, I mean, who knows who wrote the ballads, but the original ballads, the romanzas that came from Spain, are actually, like, adopted from the Spanish ballad tradition. They're not even Jewish. Like, in the way that they've been changed sometimes is that, like, if the first person reference makes it sound like the person singing is Christian, the the Sephardic version will kind of have like a sudden and very strange switch of tense. <laughs> like suddenly something, something's referred to in the third person and you're like, why? And then you realize, oh, because this person singing it didn't want to sing about personally being involved in something Christian and the song is... Oh. So, so the original ballads came from that and... Who, who knows? Like, they may- wait. Did so so instead of saying like, I went over to the river and put a rock on on a tree, they would say that girl over there went over to the river and put a rock on a tree. Something like that, like where there's some like you're reading through, and it's true. Like also, if, like you're in the like the child ballad, like the British Isles ballad collection that um, the child collected. Like you'll see things like where you're when you know. I'm sure people have written their full PhDs and been like. 
this is yeah. why this is why this tense is happening here or whatever <laughs> but basically the woman's part of the tradition and um there are amazing like living academics that have r- done a lot of research on this and written about it and who I've learned a lot from like Judith Cohen and people like that that um uh but the women have just had a large influence like they have sung a lot of the you know because and the addition the songs that have been added to that tradition over the last hundreds of years it's not a hundred percent women but it very much feels like often like a woman's like singing in the kitchen type of tradition like singing while you're rocking your baby and then you end up writing you know another like a lifestyle a life cycle song or something that's about the current experience that's not from the ancient ballad tradition and maybe you take like a few lines from your favorite ballad but then you make it more personal and more your own story and so there's there's just very empowered female characters and also just some con I mean maybe I'm wrong about this but I feel like there is a contrast like the first song on the album is from an old romanza that or it's from a about a famous ballad um where the words it's called Duermite Mi Alma and but you know in the ballad it's not totally uncommon to hear a woman singing about her philandering husband which is like what the she's like sleep my darling sleep my sweetheart your father's out with another woman I mean that topic is not totally unheard of across balladry regardless of where it's from but I do feel like often in like American ballads or brat ballads that kind of are based in the British Isles that are American, there's like a murder that happens at some point, you know, like something, there's a murder or there's a man leaving the woman and the woman is like totally bereft. But in this ballad, she just locks him out of the house and just, he comes home and he's like, I'm home. And she's like, you can go wherever you were. You know, wherever you spent the night, you can spend the day also. Like, And he's like, who told you that I was, you know? And she says, I discovered it for myself, which to me is also like such a, it's such a statement of, um, I don't know, of autonomy to be like, I found out. Nobody told me. Nobody was whispering about it. I discovered this for myself. And I really identified with that character, like... You know, there wasn't, like, a real act of violence. She just was like, I've locked the, the door with, like, a lot of locks. You're never going to get in. And, <laughs> and it was especially touching because it's it's quite... The words are old, which means that women at that time really didn't have a lot of... You know, you would stay with somebody that was doing something wrong to you because, like, what were your other options? But, you know, this is, like, words from a really an old song where the woman is like, I don't care and there's a lot of, so I chose, you know, in some situations you pick and choose. You're like, here are six verses that are very feminist feeling. And here's six verses that seem like they were taken from like some other song that's just like about being heartbroken or something. But um, there really is this tradition of the tradition of, of it being carried forward by women. And um, hmm. Flori Jagoda, who just passed away really recently in D.C. and was a like a National Heritage Fellow, I think, um, you know, she carried forth like an almost just totally destroyed Bosnian Sephardic song tradition that she had like brought from Bosnia, despite the fact that I think 50 members of her family died in the Holocaust. Um, Mm. But she also wrote tons of songs, like her own songs. And some of them are like legitimately famous. Like there's a Hanukkah song that's the way that you'll hear. It'll be like, this is a Spanish Hanukkah song. And it's actually like a song Flory wrote in Ladino that's modern, that she wrote herself, that people think is a traditional song because they don't realize that people have been writing new Ladino songs for like a long time, you know, for, for hundreds of years after the expulsion and you know there are men that say, that have sung you know the first man the first recordings like Chaim Effendi and people like that but um I kind of choose to kind of grab hold of the part of the tradition that has really been carried forth by women because I just feel like I'm st- I'm just at the beginning of really exploring it to be honest like mm-hmm. I've explored it deeply through this making of this album and through writing 
new melodies, which is something that people have been doing for a long time to kind of carry the tradition forward and to make it, it feels so amazing to discover that it works for me also. You know, I think that's the biggest takeaway that I've had is people wrote new melodies. Who knows who these people were in some cases, but there are melodies that have been added to these words that are not original to the song. You know, maybe it was like a famous song in the Ottoman Empire and they just wanted to be able to sing it in Ladino or it just felt, but I was like, maybe if I write my own melodies, it will feel that new and applicable to me. And it's been just unbelievable to like, to experience that and be like, wow, it, it really does feel like that. That's how it, that's how it feels. It feels like I'm writing, I'm making this song for myself. Hmm. And I imagine that that is how a lot of women that sang these songs felt that they were like making it for themselves. And in their cases, they never even performed them in a lot of, on almost all situations. They, it wasn't like they were, you know, famous performers at all. This was music just right. for, for amusing yourself at home, but they still, you know, adopted new melodies because it felt that it made the words feel more applicable, you know, it made the words feel modern. And being able to do that now, like as a person living in the United States in 2022 with Sephardic heritage, it's just connecting you to all these invisible people and making something yeah. that they carried forward that that was old maybe you know even a hundred years ago some of these songs were already old <laughs> they already right. had old melody right, you know, right. old words and I, and then you create a style for yourself you create like kind of a folk style just for yourself that you can now write your own songs in i've heard that your work in Sephardic music, um, not only is it to kind of like educate people on this culture and you call this album a love letter to the Sephardic Jewish people, but also your work is to recontextualize the music and to show its relevance and to show that there is like nothing exotic about these stories. Can you speak to why you don't like people to think of this music as exotic and working on this album to demystify your culture? Yeah, I mean, I feel like people have for decades, that's such a good question, people have not just in Sephardic music, I mean, it happens all the time. Um, you know, there's a certain marketability when something is exotic and, you know, you can look up online, like, you you could look up like Sephardic song and you might find somebody doing something that looks very much like flamenco performance or something and I don't mean to like dismiss you know everybody does their own thing and some of it, it you know it's all as legit like I, I wouldn't want to critique somebody else's choice because obviously there are Sephardic there's probably Sephardic people that are going to hear my album and be like what is this like I don't know <laughs> what, what is she doing you know like maybe they like they live in you know a different country and this it just seems so strange or exciting or whatever to them. But basically, I think that it is arguable that, you know, when you exoticize something, sometimes it's special, but it also just doesn't, it's two-dimensional, you know? Exotic, mm. Exoticism always c causes the person or group that's being exoticized to be completely two-dimensional. That just isn't that interesting. It's not really delving into something like on a root level maybe it's connected to you know having a hard time answering those basic questions about like where do you feel you're from or whatever there's always this feeling of like okay I'm I'm just exoticizing myself like I could just say that I'm from wherever I'm living right now and conform to something so that it makes sense to people and it I don't feel like I'm being put on the spot and I've become performing my own identity and I feel like it's important as a as a person that like represents some degree of like a minority experience, you know, Jewish people are there's like a mainstream of Jewish culture, but you know, Jewish culture is still a minority culture um in the United States and everywhere in the world. I feel misrepresented by the kind of exot exoticization or the mainstreamization of Jewish culture as one kind of monolithic thing it's not that exciting to, you know, like maybe it's exciting. You'll get, you have like one, you'll have like a 10 minute spot on like a certain holiday where like it'll be covered, but 
to really make music over the course of a long period of time to really like make songs that feel deep and intel you know and say something more you know to really feel like in those moments where things aren't going well and your voice is feeling rough and you had a performance where you know somebody didn't laugh at the joke that you made or you just didn't you know you're (laughs) sending out a million booking emails or whatever, you have to have something to really grab onto that feels like it has substance to me, you know, and that that's why I'm saying I'm not going to critique somebody else's expression, but for me to like do a version of a Sephardic song with a old melody and do it as, you know, try to, I don't come from Turkey. So if, if the song, if the melody is a Turkish melody and it would traditionally have been, either sung solo or if you were going to perform it, maybe you'd use Turkish instruments. To me, that feels much more appropriative than to say, I'm going to write my own melody that's influenced by music that I've played all my life that Mm -hmm. feels close to people a little, like one has one foot in this other culture. And, you know, one of that one foot that it has is that it's very, if you speak Spanish, you can understand a lot of these songs. So you know, I have had people come up to me who are Spanish speakers from, I had a really amazing person come up to me once, like at a show about right before the pandemic, where I sang some of these songs, and she came up and said that her family's Peruvian, and that it had inspired her to think about, she understood the songs, but it also made her think about what indigenous language her grandmother spoke that she wishes she could understand more about. And I just thought like so much of us have these complex roots and people are going to feel the emotion and the depth behind these songs much more deeply if I do them in a way that feels really authentic to me as a musician. Before we go, will you do the lightning round? I will do the lightning round. <laughs> yes. Uh, I feel like th- I feel like you're always like this is the ch- this is the fun part and every person on the podcast is like, "Oh god, oh god." <laughs> what is she Are you ask? feeling that way? I'm taking a deep breath and, you know, we'll see what my answers are. All right. Okay, here we go. First question, what is your karaoke song? Oh, man, I just can't do karaoke. I've tried a few times. One time I sang Shop Around by um, uh, (laughs) Smokey Robinson, and that went sort of okay. Is there any Sephardic karaoke? I, that would be really cool. There isn't as far as I know. There should be. Well... Maybe you can start it in Paris. Uh, All right. Uh, What is your coffee order? It is always an oat milk cappuccino. First celebrity crush. Ooh, first celebrity crush. I'd say... Hmm, it's very difficult. Maybe... You know, probably Natalie McMaster or something like that. <laughs> That's a kid. <laughs> uh, who is the nicest musician you've ever met? Actually, probably Natalie McMaster. I'll go with that. <laughs> she is real. Oh she God. is really, really nice. Um, what was your first concert? Ooh, I might not be able to remember my first concert, but that um, probably the the first concert that was really really memorable was that open house concert with kevin burke and maybe also i saw johnny clegg a few times so one of those wow yeah were your parents and really into johnny clegg oh yeah 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 i grew up yeah. with all that music oh my it, god it's really and actually i'm shocked that it didn't come up at all in that he's such an important musician to me and it was really oh, sad wow. when he died so oh um what was the last book you read Ooh, ooh, really difficult. Um, you know, this year, because I've been in Paris and I'm doing this Fulbright, like the main book in my life is this um, Ladino textbook by Marie-Christine Bournes Barol. And it's amazing because even though it like, it's really about learning Ladino, it has so much interesting like cultural stuff and I, I'm getting close to being finished with it. So maybe I'll say that, but... The wow. last novel I read was, I recently reread um, A Suitable Boy, which I think is a pretty amazing book. Okay, this is the last question. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? I'm, re- I'm bad at like the, the 
best thing is this type of question, but I had like a recent epiphany that basically the last place where I felt really relaxed. Let's see, I, I was just like up close to Ithaca in New York, but I'd say that like, I'm unwilling to say which place is the most beautiful. I've been a lot of really beautiful places. Like, you know, the Red Sea is really beautiful and cities are, you know, Paris and New York, even New York, which is not a beautiful city, but it has its own, <laughs> it has its own beauty. You know, there's beauty in everything. So I guess wherever I am, where I'm not too anxious is the most beautiful place. I like that answer. Yeah. I, like, I will accept that answer wholeheartedly. <laughs> Uh, well, Lily, thank you so much for talking today. Honestly, I feel like I only got through like a quarter of these questions I had for you. So we'll have to have you back on whenever <laughs> you want. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. And it's really been great chatting. And yeah, thanks. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by me, Cindy House. Alex Stanton composes our music. Basic Folk is proud to be on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can check us out at their website, thebluegrasssituation.com. You can also check us out on the SiriusXM app by searching for Basic Folk. You can get Basic Folk wherever you find your podcasts or at our website, basicfolk.com. Thanks a lot for listening all the way to the end of the episode. Aren't you something? Talk to you next time. Bye.